Mr. Lopez. Here. Mr. Wright. Here. Mr. Kirby. Here. And Mr. Hennis. Here. And uh, thank you everybody for showing up this afternoon. I uh, and thank you, Mary, for reaching out to me. I just barely walk in and sit there and just see this. Enjoying a cool moment, as a matter of fact. So um, we have before us uh, item B, which is fiscal year 2020, 2023, the proposed MNO budget. Um, is Matt going to make this? I'm assuming I'm kind of picturing who's at the meeting. Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Mr. Uh, Dr. Strom is prepared to go through the presentation that you have in your board docs. And feel free to ask any questions uh, that you may have as we go through it. And he is all set. <laughs> you all are. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh -huh. My pleasure. Is there sound here? Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Mr. President, members of the board, it is a pleasure to be here this evening uh, to show you uh, a presentation that is aligned to the proposed budget. As you're aware, the proposed budget must come before the board, uh, and then it must uh, sit out there in the public for approximately 10 days before the final budget for the first budget gets approved, the adopted budget gets approved in July. Uh, just so you know, from there, we'll look at budget revisions for December as we continue to adjust and monitor the budget throughout the year, and then we'll look at budget uh, revisions also for May as we continue to adjust the budget throughout the year. Um, so uh, this is just 10 slides, and if you let me get through it, I'll take questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So this is basically the mission and vision for Casa Grande Union High School District, and I will tell you that if you were to select the priorities and goals uh, within this mission and vision that this budget aligns to, it is simply that we want to effectively use our resources, that's the very bottom one, and efficiently use our resources to provide safe and healthy learning environments. A lot of this budget was consumed in the budget additions from the state legislature, was consumed by placing more money to salary schedules, 3% raises uh, uh, throughout the district, and then finding positions that are key to the vision of the governing board and Dr. Battle so that we can drive student learning outcomes into the 21st century uh, era with things like modern classroom and make sure our outcomes in this district continue to get better and better year in and year out. So I would highlight the fifth bullet, effective and efficient, uh, use of resources within Casper and Union to drive positive, safe, and healthy learning environments for students throughout this district. Um, I will tell you on the capital side, there's valuable curriculum that's getting uh, pushed in this as well. Uh, we are transitioning from another uh, provider of online content to Edmentum, and Edmentum is uh, what I would consider, and many people would consider, a better resource for students to drive greater uh, throughout the curriculum. Uh, uh, process for students in their in, in their learning and both the online environment and an unplugged modality when needed. So those are the three things I'd highlight that this budget really tries to get at uh, for this district this upcoming year. Once again, this is a proposed budget that will lead into an adopted budget and it, the board should be aware that there will be December revisions and May revisions depending on how we need to adjust things in the budget to stay healthy uh, for upcoming school years. All right, that is the alignment through the strategic plan. Some keynotes here. Uh, the proposed FY23 budget uh, was developed on numbers that were just finalized on June 23rd. Uh, this was the latest. I've been at the district office for this is my 12th year in district office administration, and this is the latest I've ever seen a state budget come out. I don't know if Dr. Battle has been at this a little longer than I have, and I don't know if she's seen something come out later than this. This is this late. As it, as it's late. This, this is, is pretty late. late. Yeah, so that was last Thursday. Big kudos to Mrs. Salazar up in the business office. That means between last Thursday and all the way to today, her and I were working with Dr. Battle and making sure that we were putting this budget together. That does not mean there's mistakes in this budget. It does mean that there's room to continue to visualize where the board and Dr. Battle want to take new dollars coming in. The biggest development out of the June 23rd uh, 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 item that was passed in the PRB bill, the budget reconciliation bill, is that the per student funding level went from approximately 4390 up to $4,775. 
Uh, and that means that that was the largest per student increase since 20 by 2020, which was initiated by Governor Ducey. Uh, this was this, now Governor Ducey got a 20 by 2020 through uh, the state land uh, uh, funds that are set aside. This is most of this money came via the general fund. So the location of where these increases came was primarily through the general fund. One thing that you should note is even though that's about a $380 increase in per student funding, we did have to give up 1.25% in, in what they call the teacher uh, evaluation program. Uh, don't quote me on the year here. Back in the 1980s, this you used to have to apply to the state board to be part of a teacher evaluation program. If you sh sh showed the Arizona Department, uh, the Arizona State Board of Education, that you had a competent teacher evaluation program, they would let you increase your budget by 1.25%. So even though the per student amount went up by $380, we did give up. 1.25% of our overall budget net, that means that this budget has about 2 million extra dollars from the June 23rd, 2022 uh, budget that was passed by the state. And uh, you know, on a four day turnaround, what are you gonna do with the 2 million extra dollars? Uh, I will tell you there's a few things going through my head right now. Uh, first of all, first of all, the governing board back battle will set direction for what we're gonna do with the 2 million extra dollars. The next thing that these that you need to know from a business side of the point, uh, uh, but from a business side of the district that we're thinking about is we do have a really important uh, 2022 override coming up that is worth approximately three million dollars for this mm -hmm. district. And so, if the November of 22 override, uh, you know, uh, hits uh, a, a, a place where uh, the community may not support that, then the two million dollar increase doesn't really become realized at $2 million because you'll have a $3 million kind of offset if you can't pass that override in November 23. So there's a little bit of conservatism going through my, my blood and that, hey, this is new money. We know we want to increase uh, certain salary schedules throughout the district. Um, we know that's happened uh, at the board meeting several times on behalf of several board members. I've heard that from Dr. Battle several times this spring. We want to continue to increase salaries and get competitive in the market. Uh, uh, for our staff throughout the district, uh, but at the same time, we approach it through a lens of we've gotten really good local support throughout this district for the last several decades. And uh, even with this jump in student funding and the general fund, I will tell you Arizona is still 48 in the nation in funding. So even with the jump, it's not as if school districts throughout Arizona all of a sudden are going to have a huge amount of dollar of excess dollars uh, to do wonderful things and raise the teacher salary to, you know, there's a you know, Dallas Fort Worth schools are advertising in downtown Phoenix to attract teachers to go from uh, Phoenix to Dallas, right? Why would they do that? Well, the average cost of a home in Dallas is less. And why would they do that? Well, because they pay teachers on average $70,000 a year. It's still going to be difficult, even with the increase from the state even with pending overrides in a lot of localities to get the average teacher salary in Arizona up to $70,000, $80,000 in budgets throughout districts throughout the state of Arizona because we are still 48th in the, in the nation in funding. And this might even be able to, to 47. The kudos to the state legislature is this. I was once you know, a teacher for 13 years in a system that was 49th or 50th. So since I've been teaching, it's moved from 49 to 50 to 48, then maybe this gets us up to 47 in terms of funding. Uh, so we don't want to be really negative, but we also want to do things in terms of, 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 you know, the fact of the matter is this funding was needed. Uh, it's very beneficial to districts. We're really appreciative of all the state legislatures that supported this bipartisan passing of the budget re 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 reconciliation bill and uh, are really appreciative of the work. Uh, but it in in total can't move the needle from being you know one of the worst paying states in the in the nation to the best paying state in the nation for educators. Okay, that's kind of the bullet yeah. point one. Uh, comment on that. Um, there is uh, the slogan with that last slide. That the vouchers um, came to fruition um, without any what seven to eight thousand dollars per kid. You get a debit card and you can use it to uh, um, take a, a student to a different district where you can or take it to a different school, etc. Any 
Does that mean that uh, students from QTUHS could go to, uh, what do we have, um, uh, Variety Animations or Pinnacle or what's the other one in there? Um, did they take that money to go there? Uh, Mr. Hannes, uh, my question to you, this is uh, Pinnacle is a private school in the city of Casa Grande? That's a question. Yeah, you can, they said you could take it to five private schools now, right? Yeah, so here, here's, here's the reason I ask that question is this. I, from my dealings with Pinnacle up in the Valley, they are a charter school. That's correct. And you've always been able to go to a charter school without an ESA, an Empowerment Scholarship Account funding. Uh, if there's a private school down here, that's where the vouchers really come into play. And you are correct. There's a bill by Toma. I had thought it didn't have legs, and Dr. Battle and I were communicating back and forth on whether it might pass. And then at the last moment, that bill, I think it's House Bill 2853, did pass. And so, yes, uh, empowerment scholarships accounts are open to a wide swath of students throughout the state of Arizona. And that means they can get these vouchers and the Arizona Department of Education administers those vouchers and they can move to private schools in, in the Valley, uh, you know, or even in Casa Grande, if you have a parent who works up in the Valley, that would be someone down here taking their kid to Brophy Prep and, and having their student go to Brophy Prep on an empowerment scholarship account. There is a general belief that not that many there's students. A, there's, what, there's a whole bunch of, that have kind of popped up the Innovation Academy, and I, I don't mean to keep saying innovation, but there's a whole bunch of those different schools. There's a couple in the Basha area. And I'm not sure there's one up uh, on the north side of Casa Grande, a lot of those Christian school, so I'm not sure that's right. Um, if that's a private school, also, so. it, it is likely with it if it's related to a religious organization, it's likely it's private. So, that'd be a good example in the city of Casa Grande. So, yes, that did pass, and that's another reason, just so the board's aware on you know, why don't you have a plan? So, the, the BRB bill just passed Thursday, and why don't you have a plan on how we're going to spend this money in the district four days later? Well, generally, there is an idea of where we want to expend the new dollars at, right? There's a plan that Dr. Battle is supportive of that uh, she has had individual conversations with board members on, on kind of where we want to take this district in terms of supporting salary and compensation. But one thing that does worry uh, people on the business side of the house is, hey, let's, let's be very careful with how student counts roll in this year. Uh, the state legislature doesn't, doesn't think that the expansion of the empowerment scholarship accounts is going to result in a wide swath of students taking advantage of it, primarily because of the transportation portion. The parents are still going to have to transport kids to and from, uh, which is problematic for a lot of parents. Um, so, but with that being said, we want to be careful. We think we're going to grow by about 160 students. That'll show up in a later slide here. If, if ESAs uh, impact that, or actually it's the third bullet point down as I'm looking up there, it does show up in a graph later on as well. If ESAs impact that and we don't grow by 160 kids, then this budget will need to take into consideration the fact that we didn't grow by as much as we thought uh, we were going to grow, and ESAs do play into that. Uh, so all those things are going through our mind, and I'm glad you brought it up, uh, President Hannes. Uh, the, yeah, that did pass by a uh, bill by uh, Rep Representative Tomo. And the uh, one other question, and, and kind of with you, and, and I was kind of trying to hear and listen at the same time. You mentioned online, um, catch ran online and education and online, et cetera. I think your district needs to be very careful um, as we're promoting in the, in the community right now. There's a little bit of mis uh, kind of understanding or miscommunication or, or mis. Um, maybe promotion by the district on what the modern classroom is and what our online academy is that they are two separate things and that kids aren't, um, that the online is one thing and that the modern classroom is a different thing. We, yes, it would be my pleasure to um, continue uh, President Hannah's communications to create some clarity in what the instructional models are. So we do have some plans to do that. And quite honest with you, the more we uh, not use modern classroom at large, but rather blended learning, self-paced learning, mastery-based learning, gives more descriptors to what the modern classroom project is. And then secondly, in regard to uh, Innova, 
is no longer an online educational school. It's going to be a virtual school that our students are going to be using technology, of course, but it's not independent of, or I should say, missing student and teacher interaction. So we have a marketing campaign that I'm working with Mr. Griffiths, uh, Matt with Jennifer uh, today. Um, so we've got some work to do. And I think moreover, we are creatures of habit. We've been in education for a very long time and there are systems that one might call traditional. So we are, if you will, you know, graying what's in people's minds. And the more we are consistent with our message and we invite people to see what it is we're doing, the better off we are. So I would agree with you that we have to create some clarity. We also need to educate our community that every school has been one-to-one -one for several years. So I don't believe people understand that. And then lastly, I will say this, that currently, as we walk the classrooms, uh, students are already using devices 99.9% .9 in all of the classes that you do walkthroughs. So we've got some work to do, um, and I look forward to that opportunity to educate our community, invite them in to understand the process, and then also we have to perform. And so we have to be sure that we're providing the educational learning uh, so that in October, we will start to see you know, what our CCRIs say, and also how many kids are going to college or university. What are our metrics that tell us our students are meeting the family and individual uh, needs of our students? So yes, long answer, but I would agree with you 100%. Okay, and I, I got the question the other day, and there's, this was from my parent with a, a student coming into the freshman class this coming year. She kept on saying online, online, and online to me, and I was like, it's not online. Correct. Yes. I said, you, we are in a classroom, and we've, we've created a different kind of learning system that's similar to what we're doing right now, but it has opportunities for kids to go along at a little more of their own pace, but it's not on an online classroom. Yes, sir. It would be better defined as internet-based, wouldn't it, rather than online? You know, and I think your point is, well, Mr. Wright, what words are we going to be using to describe it, mm -hmm. right? So we will be using internet, and I look at Mr. Griffiths again. Uh, we have some plans in place and also the city. So I would agree with you. <coughs> we just have to get our message out, and I think more people come in to see us. Because it'd be, like Jack is trying to say, a lot of people have that vision as online back in our in our COVID days when we when we conducted classes online and the kids were at home, I think that's the pushback that the parents are maybe having with that. We need to get that vision out of their head. The online is is it's, it's internet based programs that the kids do here in school. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. Yes, yeah, and I guess the thing is, it's really not even internet based. It's it's what the class is is based upon a, a teacher who's still in the classroom, mm -hmm. who's using a just a different teaching method. There's not. I mean, it's not like you're on the internet. The kids are are have access to a video and different things like that. But it's 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 a different style of of, of education in the classroom, um, not online. Not internet there. I mean, they're always able to do the internet, I guess, because every one of those classes, like you may have started battle, every kid is given a laptop at the beginning of the year. Every student, I don't mean to kid, every student is given a, a laptop, and that's just part of their, their curriculum or part of their study yes. curriculum. Yes. Real quickly, part of the reason that you're getting this opposite reaction to what's really happening and what the, what the perception is. Is it doesn't help when the dispatch comes out with the front page headline saying it's going to be online teaching. Yes. That that was definitely not a good thing to happen. No. Yes, and Mr. Lopez and I we spoke about that. That was a misprint that we're going to have to just work through and help people understand. And it was referencing Inova, um, and and uh, so actually it was referencing Pace, which is in person. So we'll continue to listen for what is being misunderstood. And then develop strategies to educate our students, our parents, and our staff so that everyone is aware and they can be the, the good messenger as to what we're trying to do. If I might, just briefly, 
I had the opportunity to, to be a part of them. Actually, it's called ESPE. And there are so many strategies around the country that are using technology to increase student learning. This is going to be traditional. It doesn't mean that we're replacing teachers. Let me say it again. It doesn't mean that we're replacing teachers. Teachers are essential to the instructional models that will be deployed in our classrooms. So I think there is something else that's been a misnomer is that technology will not replace teachers. We'll be using technologies to inform, to instruct, to engage, to create thinking opportunities for our students. Yes. So that's, that's great. And I, 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 I also, I apologize for kind of getting off of pledges or off the budget talk. Wayne brought up online. Um, I just was kind of giving some clarification there. So I guess getting back to, uh, um, I guess the, the board as a whole will hope that we need to get 100% clarification, especially with the freshman class coming in, that we need to get out of promote this really hard for understanding of what what it is we're really doing, and I, um, that we're going up, overboard on, especially with the freshman class, yes. as you want this group to be successful with as you roll this um, this new learning ish style out, or this as, um, classroom style out as we begin. But I apologize, and I meant to get Matt back on budget, so I apologize for that. No, and no worries, uh, Mr. Hennis. I think Mr. Kirby, you had a comment. Oh, sorry, sorry, Taylor. Yeah, I did, and I just, uh, at the risk of beating a dead horse, I just wanted to reiterate that um, while the modern classroom project is quite good, it's also not that unusual when when compared to just normal teaching methods. There, there's all sorts of uh, ways to teach that incorporate technology, and while a teacher, you know, may not be incorporating that technology every day, the way the modern classroom project recommends. Is there, I, I think of any number of programs that I've used in the last year um, that have been technology centered, um, and it, which all, all of which is to say that what, what we're doing in our classroom is it's not that unusual compared to what's happening in education broadly. And I, and I think that's important to keep in mind both as a board and as we talk to the public. Yes, very good. That's perfect. Thank you, Taylor. I, I apologize for, for us. Stepping on you there for a second. Oh, you're, you, you, Mr. Hennis, that is fine. And the only reason I was bringing up all that is because as you're making these innovations, uh, it does take budget to uh, be innovative in the K-12 space. Uh, and so I was just saying there are items in our budget that are accounting for how we continue to drive innovation in the Casa Grande Union High School District. I, I do really want to emphasize my, my son, uh, we just shipped him off last week to MIT, uh, where he will be a freshman next year. And I will tell you, he has one professor already this summer uh, that teaches very traditionally. He has another professor that teaches in a very blended format. And he's got another professor who uh, teaches in a flipped format. And you just have to, in today's environment, be able to adjust your learning style, uh, uh, not only to the university you attend or the post-secondary area you attend, but also to the job and business you go off to work for, because every job and business is going to have different ways that they want to get you to have the content knowledge that you're going to have to be successful in the working environment that you work. So all this links to budget, because if you don't have the budget to, to drive innovation, it's difficult to drive innovation. All right, we did go over the next couple of keynotes on here. I do want to make one little other note. Uh, for the first time in 30 years, uh, we did see an increase to dis district additional assistance to $549. That means that the state legislature uh, needs to be complimented for putting funds to capital uh, and uh, $549 per ADM. And by the way, the textbook amount at the secondary level did go up to $77 per kid. And textbooks, by the way, are not considered textbooks nowadays. They are not only learning materials that are hardback textbooks, but also online materials are considered uh, uh, also textbooks in, in, by statute, statutory definition. Here's the budget timeline. This will be quick. July 22, we adopt a budget as a district. December 22, possible revisions if needed. And May 15th is our kind of our final revision. Although in the past couple of years, there's been June revisions as well. 
Okay. Student enrollment and growth, average daily membership in this district, we increased average day, daily membership uh, this last year from 3,562 to 3,724, up about 162 kids. We're planning for another 160 kid ADM increase up to 3,884. Uh, uh, Dr. Battle and I both received an email last week uh, uh, and suggested this 3,884 number is not undoable. Uh, we have more enrollments than that. The question becomes, are we going to see the full first through 10th day enrollment at the number we need to make 3,884? Um, but as of right now, we are over 4,000 students on the rolls. It just it depends on how many kids come into fruition in July. And that goes back to why you approach budgets with caution in July, because you want to see your first 20 days numbers, 10 to 20 day numbers roll in, because that 10 to 20 day mark really tells you where you're probably going to be at day 100. The general heuristic is whatever you're at at day 10 to 20, you're probably going to be right there for day 100. And the first 100 days are how you collect your ADM outside of the virtual learning environment where you collect five minutes. So these are all the factors. So what, what, I, what I hear there is it's really key to make sure that we're out getting all the kids and have a good grasp right at the beginning of the year to be able to generate numbers that are viable through the balance of the year. That, that is correct. And uh, from my understanding, uh, now I'm going to use her first name. I should know her last name, but Jeanette is it Jeanette. It's Beecham uh, has been tasked with making sure that uh, high schools are on track for converting uh, possible enrollments into actualized enrollments is how I'll term it. And they hit their 80% actualized enrollment mark, which Dr. Battle set for them uh, earlier this spring. And now it's about, can we drive 80% to 90%, 90% to 95%? But yes, you're correct, Mr. Henderson. Thank you. Yeah. Factors affecting the budget. Uh, we have student enrollment. That's the biggest factor that affects the budget. Yeah, it funds both your capital and MO. Capital transfer. This district has traditionally transferred money from MO into capital. That will continue in this budget cycle. We'll cover that here in a second. Tuition revenue. That's for your foreign exchange students typically that come into the district. You can charge tuition revenue. The legislative items that was spoken about already uh, legislation BRP bill this year increased per student funding by $380 per student. And then adjustments in uh, by the ADE. The ADE may come in and say, hey, you overreported your transportation mileage. We're going to adjust your budget down. They may come in and say, hey, you underreported your average daily membership two years ago. We're going to adjust your uh, uh, budget up. How does that happen? In, in general, there are these things called 15915s, and districts in Arizona are constantly filing them. And so when one district files a 915 form, it can actually come back and affect your ADM when they file a 915 form. And that happens continuously uh, past, it can happen back to 1920 at this point. So it happens continuously. And we constantly updates from the ADE on how much we need to adjust budgets by. So that's that bottom right corner. And then your carry forward, how much do we expend through the prior year budget is basically what that is. And we're starting to see encumbrances uh, come down, which they should be, because you should be closing POs at this point in year. And right now we're thinking this next year's budget will have about $7.3 million to uh, carry forward on the MO side. And I'll go through the capital side in a second. Big level ideas off of page seven. Uh, we, we ended last year with a $28.6 million budget. Uh, next year we're going in with a proposed budget uh, of $32.1 million. That's a difference of $3.4 million. That is largely because of the increase in funding from the state legislature that just happened last Thursday. Capital transfer, we're gonna take the capital transfer down. We had it at $600,000 traditionally in this district this last year. We moved it to 1.2 million. We're moving that back down to 772,000. Uh, so that's a positive differential of 427,000. Prop 123 is $278,000 uh, that we typically have left in m and we're going to move that to capital this year. And the reason we're going to move that to capital this year is because Prop 123 is set to expire in 25 26. Prop 123 is supposed to be one time money. There was a bill this year that was on the floor that said that to, to continue Prop 123. This is the governor's 25 20 plan, uh, went, went in and was funded via the state land trust, and it's supposed to expire in 25 26. So you have to be really careful about doing ongoing MO expenditures with one, two, three money because it expires in 25, 26. If this bill, the extension of Prop 123 passes next year, then we can start having conversations centered around, hey, that can be an MO item now. 
because of the fact that it's on ongoing money at that point. You have an override, I already told you, it's increasing this next year to about 3 million bucks, 3.1 million, 3.069 million is what it's increasing. Why is the M&O going up? Uh, when the revenue control limit goes up, as the legislature approved last Thursday, your M&O amount goes up. The other reason the M&O is going up is because your student enrollment's going up. It went up by 160 students last year. Uh, the override's always calculated off last year's numbers, last year's student enrollment, with this year's per student funding amount. So uh, it's a combination of your enrollment went up and then this year's per student funding amount went up. And as a result, your override's going up uh, to $471,000. And then carry forward sitting right now at 7.278. All total, that's a $41 million budget headed into, oops, headed into next year. And, <laughs> and, and that's a difference of about $4.7 million. Some of this money has already been expended, right? So yeah, and please, 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 I apologize for Please clarify on the quick carry forward because suddenly you know people will see, you know, Laura, what are you doing with this? You've got this excess money. These are for projects that weren't completed. These are tell me, you know, where the money is. Um, the actual money, but it's when you say carry forward, it's yeah, not true. What when people view what care what they think is carry forward? Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit here. $32 million is your ongoing budget. That, that's the top line. That's ongoing. That's what you can spend on your personnel. 85% of the MO budget, approximately, depending on the district, is spent on per people, people and benefits, people and benefits. And so that $32 million is really what you have to spend on people and benefits, right? The MO override is a seven year override with five years of full amount and then a drawdown in year six and year seven. And so we're currently headed into year four of that override, and then we'll have a full year five, and then it draws down if the voters don't pass it. That $3 million, by the way, is 10% of your, you can tell up top, it's 10% of your overall budget, and we're on a 10% override, right? And, and it, it goes back into salaries and benefits. But you have to be careful with your override amount because of the fact that it's not necessarily ongoing unless the voters determine, hey, we're going to let you... Uh, have your override for another seven years. Now, the good news in this year's election is that override is a continuation. It doesn't affect your tax rates. Tax rates stay the same uh, because you're already on an override in this district. And then the carry forward, really, once your money doesn't get expended in the budget, that money really should be considered as one-time funding. And it's hard with one-time funding to put that into people. It's hard with one-time funding to put that into salaries and benefits because you're not getting that ongoing. You're really only getting the $32 million up top. So projects, with that carry forward, we have uh, capital projects that need to get done. That's why you transfer money over on the capital side. Uh, Mr. Bellock and his team have worked on the auditorium stage this year. They worked on the choir room this year. Um, they've worked on was that the gymnasium this year. All those projects come out of those one-time funds and are smartly spent out of those one-time funds because redoing a gym is really a 30-year deal. Right? You got to resurface the floor and say in the polish floor, but redoing a gym is really a 30-year deal. And redoing the auditorium. Would uh, 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 is really a 30 year deal if you keep carrier floor. So that's why those one time funds, that $7.3 million, is really better used for one time funds because it's not ongoing. And you can see a district that puts that money in personnel and benefits quickly draw down their reserves. One other element for the taxpayers they need to know is you have got to have reserves on hand. If this community uh, decides, that they support a bond, let's say four years from now, three years from now, two years from now, and you have no reserves, when you go to sell your bonds, you're gonna have fun paying high interest rates because the very first thing those those that Moody's is gonna come in and look for is are you uh do you do you have solvency in your district? Do you have funds available just in case you hit hit a hiccup? And uh, if you want the lowest interest rates that you pay on your bonds, then you need to have reserve funds available, and that carry forward amount should be consider two things. One, it should be considered for one-time projects that should last the district 20 to 30 years. And two, it should be considered as reserve funds so that when you get your credit ratings and you sell bonds, you can sell bonds at the lowest possible interest rate. You can get double A rating or A plus, a, a, a double plus rating, depending on the rating institution that you go through. Uh, so you can get those interest rates low. Did I answer your question, Mr. Hennis? Yeah, man, I guess it's a, it's a key for the district to kind of, um, in that carry forward, either kind of broadly delineate items of what, what we 
we had, you know, what was the plan to use that carry forward for going into the future? Yes, that is a directive from Dr. Battle to me, is that when I get on board here on July 5th, that we have a master capital plan uh, put into place. I will tell you, I've already met once with Mrs. Salazar and Mr. Belloc, who have taken me through what Mr. Belloc put together for capital planning, and it is uh, very well done, and we just need to kind of uh, look at the way we're pricing things and estimating things and dial it in a little better, and then we'll have a master capital plan. Uh, in front of Dr. Battle with project dates and even inflationary, you know, if you, the, the same project today <laughs> might cost you 10, 15% to, well, to uh, two years from now, might cost you 20, 25% more three years from now. And there's an actual economic table that I use to calculate, you know, what your cost of replacing something in 28 is going to be versus replacing it in 25 is going to be. So, yes, that master plan is extremely important for that $7.3 million. And really, I'm telling you, you wouldn't be wise as a district to spend through that whole $7.3 million uh, because you want reserve money to help you out with your bond ratings when you go 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 out to bond. So, well, that $7.3 million, if we don't pass a bond override, is gone in two years, correct? Uh, yeah, the general the general rule, we have about 600,000 square feet of space here. That's off the top of my head. It might be like 660 if I remember my numbers right. But the general heuristic is it, it costs you about $7 a square foot to maintain your buildings. And so I can transition to the next slide, seven times 600,000 is 4.2 million. And you can see that we're only getting uh, uh, 2.4 million of ongoing funding next year uh, from the state. Now, very grateful they increased the amount to $549 per ADM. Uh, that's why you're seeing a $400,000 increase from 2 million to 2.4 million. So, you know, attitude of gratitude is very nice. What happened with the state legislature and state legislature, uh, once again, we're on a bipartisan basis to get this BRB bill passed. Uh, but with that being said, uh, at $7 a square foot multiplied by 600,000 square feet, 4.2 million is what it probably costs to maintain our buildings. That's why we constantly are going after grants. Mr. Belloc and Mr. Uh, Dr. Battle, well before I got, you know, got here, were already on one grant uh, in terms of replacing chillers at Vista Grand, eh? and that's a million dollar project that is gonna get funded through grants. Right, so you're always out going for grants on the capital side because the 2.4 million dollars falls short. And what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is at 4.2 million dollars of ongoing expenses that are expected on seven dollars a square feet, we're short 1.8 million dollars every year on the capital side. And in being short, think how quick you'll spend through seven million dollars when you're short 1.8 million dollars on the capital side. Now, that's this is not a Casa Grand thing. I want to be real clear here. This is every district in the state of Arizona struggles with the limited capital funding they have in comparison to the square footage they have to maintain. So I want to make sure every taxpayer in the city understands this is not, oh, we're struggling because people are mismanaging budget. No, every district I've ever been in struggles with maintaining their facilities to the highest quality standards when you're only getting $549 per ADM. So yes, you can burn through your $7 million quite quickly. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. So here's your capital side of things. Uh, district additional assistance is up by four hundred thousand dollars this year. We're going to limit that uh, capital transfer down to seven hundred seventy-two thousand. So that's a negative. It comes down to, uh, by four hundred twenty-seven thousand. Prop one two three allocation is up to uh, by two fifty-six. The reason we're moving at the capital once again is because that's one time funding until the state legislature continues the twenty-five twenty-six time frame and beyond. Uh, the state land trust is in a healthy position. We're hoping that our lobbyists can get that done and that the Prop 123 funding can continue past 2526. Interest earned, we're a little short on interest earned in that account. You can add your interest that you earn in this account back on your budget. It's one of the areas that you want to keep cash in this account so you can continue to earn interest. You cannot do this in MO. Uh, the reason we're short on interest this year is because we continue to accumulate interest, and that number will probably rise uh, through our September. Uh, 15th AF, uh, AFR process, September 15th AFR process. So the December revision will probably have a little more interest in it. And then carry forward in capitals at $2.8 million currently. Um, and I'll give you another project for that $2.8 million that we, we expect to probably come to fruition. We have some uh, fire panels that need to be inspected and, and looked at. We have some uh, 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 building management systems that need to be looked at as well throughout the district to make sure 
uh, that we're as secure as we possibly can be for the safety of our students. Um, and that includes remote entry on exterior doors. So we constantly want to be in, in, in then also cameras. And so we constantly want to be analyzing those systems and keeping them up to date because that's the safety and security uh, of our students and, and our staff. So all total, we have about a $1.5 million increase from 4.7 to $6.2 million on the capital side. Um, of which 400,000 was due to the increase in uh, uh, funding from the state legislature uh, and another one, one million dollars approximately is due to the increase in carry for the district additional assistance side. Other points of interest? And within that, uh, the capital, you have a, you have a, a security component also of beating up security at uh, the campuses? Yes, correct. That, that is a, something that uh, uh, David has emphasized with us quite a little bit. That is probably because Dr. Battle is constantly talking to them about that. And the IT department is really intimately involved uh, with uh, access controls, fire panels, because almost everything runs through your IT department nowadays. Uh, cameras uh, runs through your IT department. So yes, that is correct. That's right, thank you. Other points of interest, page three is the classroom site fund. Uh, if you want to look at the classroom site fund details, uh, it's funded about $708 per student this year, a little bit down from the prior year. This is how uh, pay for performance gets paid out in the district. And by the way, that's all in one fund now, so the page looks a little different because it's all in fund 10. Page four is the detail of capital funds by object code. If you want to look at how we're spending it by object code, uh, object code meaning like, are you spending it on furniture? Are you spending it on vehicles? Things along those lines. Uh, and then page five is your bond, SFD, and adjacent waste fund. Uh, if you want to look at that, that's going to be primarily blank because this, this district does not assess an adjacent waste tax yet. And it does not assess, uh, it does not have any bonds that are uh, currently have any uh, monetary value in any of our funds. And then finally, the grants page is page six on the grant side. And with that, I will take questions uh, on this year's upcoming proposed budget that you will be then, uh, based on uh, feedback, uh, bring you an adopted budget in July. Just a man, one, one last question um, for me on the uh, all of the extra money, all of the other monies associated with uh, the come from the government, especially with COVID and different other aspects, all that money disappears when? This year? Next year. 22, 23, then 23, 24, and then you're done. Okay. And, and we uh, have a master plan on that. Uh, expenditure and the balance the last I checked was approximately seven million dollars and so that seven million dollars will be getting used uh, for the remainder of these next two school years. The key there is we were allotted this money and we need to tightly monitor that money. Uh, one other thing for the public to tightly monitor that money so that we can realize full expenditures of those dollars. Uh, one other thing the public needs to understand is uh, ESSER dollars are very restricted compared to a lot of other pots of money. You know, typically a district you manage close to 60 to 70 funds. There's some funds like direct reimbursement, which is called the MIPS fund, Medicaid reimbursement fund, that have very little restrictions on them. Uh, there are other funds that, that have more restrictions on them, like M&L. Then there's funds that are grant funds, and grant funds typically come with you know, pretty high regulation in terms of what you can spend it on. For example, of the last allocation of ESSER 3, 20% of that money has got to be spent on direct direct learning loss for students. You have to, um, and you have to show uh, to the state of Arizona that you've spent 20% of those funds. So in this district, if that was approximately $7 million in the last fund that came to you, that means $1.4 million of it has to be spent in this objective for kids. And so it's not as if you get a $7 million gift from the federal government and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, there are some districts originally with these ESSER funds were trying to explore construction projects and there are regulations on, on what you can spend on the construction side and what you can't spend on the construction side and it boiled down to whether it was improving your HVAC system and not improving your HVAC <laughs> system in a lot of cases. So I just need the, the public to understand that uh, the ESSER dollars are very restricted in comparison to some other pots of <coughs> this governing board and now uh, uh, get a driver direction. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
for that answer. <coughs> Mr. Lopez. Yeah, a couple of questions. You mentioned in the beginning there's a 10 day waiting period for the public to review the budget. Is that correct? Yep. Now, they can review it, but do they have any actual input as far as changes or? Or, or do you consider what they're saying and then you can make some adoptions to that? Well, it, or, or is it just strictly, hey, this is what it is, you're getting to see it, but you have no input? The primary entity that votes and approves on the budget is the governing board. So if people that see and view the budget want to give feedback to Dr. Battle or governing board members, are certainly welcome to. And then the governing board is the one that drives, you know, the, the board's got three objectives by statute one set your policies, two set your budget, and three high. Hire the superintendent, right? Those are your three objectives as a board. So what, what I would say is if feedback comes and we need to make adjustments based on the direction of the governing board, we can make adjustments. Uh, but in terms of direct feedback to Dr. Strong and hey, I can't believe you're doing this with the budget, I'll take it. I, I'm always there to listen, uh, but it really wouldn't be actionable for me, it'd be actionable for the board. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned okay. earlier that Arizona's 47 right. Right. Go. could drop into 46. Um, what is the big differentiation from 46 to say 40? Is it massive or is it is it negative? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and this is gonna be off the top of my head. Uh, and these numbers I can go research this further, but let's go first to where we're at. So four thousand seven hundred and seventy-five dollars per ADM ends up Every student's worth more than one ADM, right? High school students are worth 1.26 ADM. So by the time you convert it from an ADM, an average daily membership number, to a per student number, most districts in the state of Arizona get between $8,000 and $9,500 per student. You go to the Northeast, cost of living is different. You got to take into all account all these economic factors. But you in the Northeast can see the states get out twenty dollars to $30,000 per student. That's so, what I wanted to touch on the yeah. fact that you said there's recruitment going on in Phoenix for Dallas yep. teachers. Um, but you also said that cost of living is lower in Dallas. Is that substantial as well? Is it, is it quite a bit lower? Yeah, the median yeah. house in Dallas yeah. goes yeah. for about $350,000. State or personal taxes are like dirt cheap in Texas. Correct. Yeah. So so the district, Dallas Fort Worth is not going to advertise that you, 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 uh, have a different income uh, tax there. Uh, you have a different property tax there. A lot of it in Texas is wound up in property taxes. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that what, that's what they're trying to attract teachers on. We'll, we'll pay you a higher salary. They're getting a higher per student amount. Don't quote me at Texas. I think the last I looked, it was in $15,000 range versus 8000 to 9500 And then they're saying, hey, the cost, the median cost of a house in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is $350,000. You can afford a home there, right? And maybe that's a little lesson uh, for us in Casa Grande is, you want to teach, you come to Casa Grande. The cost of a home in Casa Grande is much more reasonable than a lot of areas, right? And so maybe there's a piece of marketing we, we can go with in terms of that. I was only bringing that up because to, to jump a district from, you know, your average on your last AFR was like $61,000 that you paid a teacher on your last AFR, right? To jump that up by $10,000, is going to take more than $380 per student, which is what was increased by the state per ADM, which is what was increased by the state this year. So the more money is appreciated, the increase to get us to move from 61000 in this district on average to $71,000 is going to need to be not just this work that was done, which we are very grateful for, but more work has to occur throughout the course of the next decade. And my final question is, I got an email regarding bus transportation increase requests. Yeah. Is that, that's included in this budget, isn't it? Because they're asking for 12%, if I remember correctly. And there's a limit of 5% that we can institute. Can you touch on yeah, that? Yeah, those are still ongoing negotiations with Durham. And so to touch on that a little bit, uh, there will most likely be an action item in front of the board uh, in July. And that action item will be uh, to uh, probably increase so that Durham has the ability to recruit drivers. When you look at your governing board docs and you look at their stats on what percent of their routes were filled, depending on the month, it's about 70 to 80 percent of the routes are filled. Right now, in the transportation world, which I, I had in my former district, right, when you 
have unfilled routes, you end up doing double runs. And double runs are you pick up a round of kids, drop them off at school, then you go back out, pick up another round of kids, drop them off at school. And you know, with double runs, sometimes kids don't get to school on time. Not that in this district, they've done pretty well to get kids to school on time, even with double runs. But if you don't have enough people running kids to and from school, right, then you can struggle with double runs and on time delivery of students. As a result, Durham's saying, hey, can you help us get to a, a more fully staffed situation? Um, the 12% increase is pretty large, and that was the original ask. We are they hit a pretty good increase last year. The yeah. last budget, the last negotiations that we had with them, they hit a pretty good increase off. Yeah, We're, we will be corresponding with them here shortly, and we are, we are, we are hoping um, that we can find a reasonable increase that was that's also within the realm of what our open employees in this district got as an increase. See, what is the so, reason that I thought the problem we was, to, was uh, uh, we didn't have a war in Russia right now, fuel costs weren't so astronomical yes. also. C correct, Mr. Hannes. Uh, the argument is you have a staffing issue and you have a fuel cost issue as well. Um, and I want to you know, recognize that we have many partners we work with throughout this district to get kids to where they can be in a place to learn optimally. Durham is one of those. And we want Durham to be successful at their job because it helps our kids be successful what they need to do. Uh, with that being said, we also want our partners to understand that we're not out giving our own employees 15, 20% increases in pay. And we are not a private company that can all of a sudden raise prices so that our revenues increase so that we can cover the new expense. Our, our so revenues are set by the state. You, you guys are in negotiations with us. You're coming back next month with where you're at. Correct, yes. Mr. Hennis. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, at, at this point, um, are there any other additional questions for Matt, for Dr. Battle? If not, I guess we can motion this to approve the proposed. This is the proposed. Um, MNO budget as presented. I call for a public adopted budget on July 12, 2022 at 6 30. Um, if we'd like to make a motion to approve that. I so move that we approve the, the 2023 proposed budget and we call for a public hearing on June 12th at 6 30. I'll second. The motion by Joe and it's a motion by Chuck and second by Joe. The call for that on July 12th. 2022. Um, Mary, can you call the vote, please? Okay. Mr. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. And Mr. Hennis? Mr. Hennis? And yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and so uh, that, that passed. We're down to item uh, C, which is personnel. Yes, just briefly, and we've got Mr. Casey here. They're working diligently and effectively, and we're considering other strategies to make sure we're fully staffed. Uh, you'll get a report on uh, this Friday, um, as I get that from our staff and the resources. So we do have some staff, teachers, um, and classified staff that we're hoping that you would receive. Okay, you have a list of personnel uh, and for you. Yes, sir. Um, is there a motion to approve the personnel items that's presented? I so move. There's a motion by Taylor. Is there a second? Second. Second. And a second by Chuck. Any uh, questions or discussions on uh, the personnel that's presented? Yeah, President Hennis, I'm looking at this list. And I know we're approving personnel because we want to fill these spots, but some of these names I recognize are some of these just extensions or transfers to some of these existing positions and not really new, new hires. Yes, sir. If I might, the first attachment, you'll see in the second to last column what the board action is, and it may be a position transfer or a new hire or a revised salary exchange. So um, if you've got questions there, it'd be our pleasure to speak to you. No, I was just looking at what the percentage of them are new hires. How many of them are either transferred to advancements? Did I answer your question? You did. Thank you. My question. 
That sounds great. Yeah, Thanks, any sir. other questions? If not, Mayor, we'll go ahead and call for the vote, please. Okay, Mr. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Mr. Kirby? What? Yes. And Mr. Hennis? Yes. We are down to item D, which is the 2022-2023 at Will Tower schedule. Yes. There's a correction. If I'm uh, and, and I actually below the side with position titles, there were no errors in the contracts, etc. So this is just approved to correct the 2022-23 at Will Tower schedule as presented. Yes, sir. So do we get a motion on that? So moved that we approve the correction of the salary schedule for the at will employees. And I will second that. But there's a motion by Chuck and a second by Joe. Any other any other questions with that? Not Mayor, we'll go ahead and call for vote, please. Mr. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. Mr. Hennis? And yes. We're down to item E, which is the academy name change. And uh, you have a motion, Dr. Bell, if you'd like to uh, walk us through this, please. Sure. Yes, sir. Just briefly, as you all know, Caspian Online Academy is what Innova is currently called. And so we are recommending to change the name officially to be submitted to the State Department of Education, Innova Occupations Virtual Academy. Okay, you have a recommendation by Dr. Battles to approve the change um, from the Online Academy to Innova and to uh, uh, get that to the state for the correction. So, is there a motion to approve that? I'll move to approve the change. I so move. So, I've got a motion and a second by Taylor then. Uh, any other questions? Motion by Joe and a second by Taylor. Any other questions on that? If if not, um, I think the only thing we need, Dr. Battle, is to make sure we get 100% clarification on what Innova is versus what the freshman incoming class is, and just general clarification in the community of what is floating out there, just to make sure there's no, uh, no, uh, as a, the least amount of miscommunication as possible. Yes. And so we'll go ahead and Mary call for the vote, please. Mr. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Kirby. Mr. Kirby? Yes, sir. And Mr. Hennis? Yes. Thank you guys and good evening. And with that, we'll go ahead and turn this meeting at 6 36. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Mr. Wright, for your conflict of interest. Thank you, Mr. Backer, first.